Welcome everyone, Adam Lafacci, your moderator, rejoining you, and we're scheduled to get started in just a few minutes. But as I mentioned before, we're going to leave you with some Smithsonian Folkways music that is going to be playing momentarily, and as soon as that's over, we'll kick off today's session. So sit back and enjoy the music. We'll be back with you in just a few minutes. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table, oh Lordy. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days, hallelujah. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days, one of these days. I'm gonna be a registered voter, oh Lord. I'm gonna be a registered voter one of these days, hallelujah. I'm gonna be a registered voter. I'm gonna be a registered voter one of these days. I'm gonna tell God on old Massey, oh Lordy. I'm gonna tell God on old Massey one of these days, hallelujah. I'm gonna tell God on old Massey. I'm gonna tell God on old Massey one of these days. We are gonna tell him as we sit at the table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table, oh Lord. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days, hallelujah. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. Great, and so that was I'm going to sit at the welcome table, courtesy of Smithsonian Folkways Recordings. And if you are interested in this song, or in any songs like it, we do encourage you to check out folkways.si.edu, where you can get a hold of more music along these lines. So we'll be kicking off the session in just about one minute, but thank you so much for listening and for joining us today. Great, and welcome back, everyone. This is Adam LaFaccia, your moderator, rejoining you and thanking you for joining us for today's Civil Rights from Lincoln to Today, part of the Smithsonian Online Education Conference Series. And we're bringing you a series of topics and sessions over the course of this year, and we do hope that you'll check out the conference website to view past archives, as well as keeping an eye out for our future sessions as they go live. Once again, my name is Adam LaFaccia, and I'll be moderating the session today. So if you have any questions, feel free to field them to me in the chat box. And 
especially technical questions, are ones that I'll respond to privately to work with you to get out sorted to get sorted out as quickly as possible. Uh, if you have any content-related questions, though, we'll be holding those for different points along the session, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. But please feel free to use the Q&A chat box on the left side as much as you'd like. And I, I see some comments already that have popped in. Uh, great to hear that the song gave some people chills. It definitely gives me chills whenever I hear it. It's a really beautiful piece, and I think really sets the tone for today's session. Now, if any of you are having technical issues that bump you out of the online room and you can't ask me for help, please feel free to email us at smithsonian at learningtimes.com, and we'll have our team there to help get you signed back into the online room. You may have also noticed that we're closed captioning our session today, and those captions are appearing right down at the bottom of the screen beneath the main content that you're looking at here. If those are distracting, then feel free to click on the little option menu in the top right-hand corner, and you can shut those off by clicking No Captions. We have just a couple of quick questions we'd like to launch for you right now. Uh, the first one is, how many people are watching this webinar with you from your location? And we put an interactive poll up on the screen where you can click on the gray bubble that best corresponds to the number of people sitting with you. And you'll notice that we'll launch a couple of polls similar to this one throughout the session today. In fact, I'm going to move this one up and launch one more poll here. We'd like to know as we're getting started, have you used online education resources from the National Museum of American History before? And feel free to click either yes or no in that box as well as clicking in the poll up top. That's great. And it looks like about 50-50 here for using resources from the National Museum of American History. So we hope that we'll be able to share some new resources with you, uh, or possibly point out some that you have never noticed before. Now the conversation is not limited to the chat box today. We do hope that you'll take a moment to go to the conference site and introduce yourself in the forums. And also, after the session is completed, continue to share your thoughts and ideas in the forum threads as well. So please do check back on the conference site to see how that discussion continues to unfold. Now, the discussion is not limited to the conference site or to the chat room. We are also in the Twitterverse. So please feel free to tweet away at hashtag civil rights. And we're also going to talk a little bit with you about Smithsonian Quest and shareable Smithsonian education badges. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ashley Naranjo for that. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, my name is Ashley Naranjo, and I'm an educator here at the uh, Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies. And we're so glad that you joined us. Um, in addition to the online sessions that we have um, the second Wednesday of each month, we also offer some digital badge opportunities for folks. And this is a great opportunity, um, if you're interested in the topics that we're discussing, to extend the learning beyond um, just to this uh, session today. So um, feel free to click on the link about badges, and it'll give you some video tutorials of how to set up your uh, classroom with the digital badge opportunities. Um, we also have a video questions challenge. So today, you'll see there are two students, um, local students from around the DC area, that have submitted video questions. And we'd love to uh, hear from folks outside of the DC area as well. So feel free, um, if you are up to the challenge, to check out our website and email learning at si.edu uh, and send us a quick video um, in the same format that we do here today um, of what your classroom um, is interested in asking. And we'll um, select a few to post throughout the next few sessions. Um, we'll also be showcasing student badge submissions, um, and I'll introduce the next two uh, badges that we have available um, in just a second. So um, once students complete the badges, they are approved by an educator advisory committee, and um, once they're approved, we might be showcasing some in the next few sessions. Uh, the first badge that we're offering is the Community Historian Badge, and that takes a look at freedom songs and the impact that they had in the Civil Rights Movement. We also take a look at um, a variety of different artifacts and um, objects, such as this Rosa Parks um, sculpture, and how that impacts student understanding 
And we also take a look at uh, the sit-ins, um, the Greensboro sit-ins as well. In the Portrait Reader badge, students um, take a look at the variety of different um, civil rights movements, women's rights movements, and activists that played a role um, in the, uh, the idea of justice everywhere and justice for everyone. Um, we also take a look at uh, the postage stamps and how they can tell a story as well. And also lo would love to hear your stories about community heroes um, who have made a difference in your, your own areas. So these are two different um, badge opportunities that we have available. And you can find out more information at smithsonianeducationconferences.org. Wonderful, and thank you, Ashley, for covering those badges for us. Some really great new badges have uh, been entered in, so it's great to have a, a sneak peek at them now. Uh, I'd also like to thank our presenters who are joining us today, Christopher Wilson and Naomi Coquillon, joining us from the National Museum of American History, both. And we'll be turning the floor over to Chris now to kick things off. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Adam, and welcome to all of our participants. Uh, in this conference, I'm really happy to be here and uh, excited to talk with you about the topic of civil rights from Lincoln to today. Uh, here in our first slide, we have a fairly typical uh, representation of how we understand and how we remember uh, the history of civil rights from this period, from 1863, let's say, to, the to 1963, from the Civil War through the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Uh, we have Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and Rosa Parks uh, pictured here. Uh, we remember this period as through sort of the eloquence and the passion and pressure of someone like Frederick Douglass, a charismatic leader who was constantly uh, working toward the end of slavery and pressuring uh, people like Abraham Lincoln um, we remember Lincoln as uh, uh, this figure cajoled and influenced by people like Douglas um, uh, and somewhat vacillating, but still, you know, a righteous, really consummate politician who uh, actually had the power to great, make great changes and eventually, you know, used it. Uh, we then often skip to 100 years later uh, with uh, Martin Luther King, a similarly charismatic leader um, at the forefront of this movement that was really sweeping the country, um, a movement that was begun by uh, another champion of sort of righteousness um, like Rosa Parks. And, you know, all that is definitely true, uh, but I think it um, that way of remembering that period leaves out uh, a lot of the story and leaves out a lot of the individuals who made those, made choices, made, took risks, took action, and made our history during that period what it was. Uh, so what I wanted to talk with you today about is, uh, is some of those other voices, those voices that we try to preserve at the Smithsonian's American History Museum. We try to tell uh, their stories through programming and through exhibitions. People like the enslaved African Americans uh, working at this is a plantation outside Savannah, Georgia, called the Hermitage Plantation. People there who were uh, pressuring uh, their their owners, their uh, overseers, and ultimately the nation to in this institution, those civil civil war soldiers, as pictured here, who fought for their own freedom and fought for, as Lincoln uh, said, a more perfect union. Um, someone like John Brown, the abolitionist who uh, who actively led a campaign and gave his life um, for um, for the end of slavery, and. Uh, ordinary folks that we might not remember in the civil rights movement. The women pictured here uh, walking every day uh, rather than taking the bus in Montgomery uh, during the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, people sitting at lunch counters all across the country. This is from the Greensboro uh, sit-ins in North Carolina that we'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, those protesting for the right to vote in Selma, Alabama. And 
Here are some folks who actually gave their lives for that right to vote in Selma in 1965 uh, or went to prison uh, during the Freedom Rides in 1961. This really um, diverse group of Americans who came from all across the country to uh, try to fight to make the, the country a better place. So that is really um, the subject that I wanted to speak about a little bit today. And it first begins at this issue of what is memory and what is history. This is something that we talk a lot about at the, about at the museum. And um, as far as when I say memory, um, I'm not talking about just what we personally remember um, in our head, what we had for breakfast this morning and the names of our uh, teachers or children. Um, it's I'm really talking about public memory or collective memory, um, the way we remember things as a society. And, and we do that through uh, at museums like the Smithsonian. Uh, we do that through monuments. We do it through uh, our entertainment and films and, and so forth. And, um, and that memory does uh, tell a story. That memory does, um, does affect our nation and, and how we how we view it, um, making myths, um, and I don't mean myths in a sense of something that's inaccurate or made up, but myths as a shared story that we all, that binds a, a, a people together is something that's really important. But myths are often very simple. Um, history, um, you know, is what trained historians do, and it's a a reconstruction of the past that's rooted in a lot of research, and it is very, it is always very complicated. Myths and memory um, are something that is, um, uh, is, is, in that it's shared, it's passed down through generations, and it stays the same. Whereas history is revised and constantly re-understood, and um, so what we're Though there's this kind of disconnect between those two things, they're equally important. And what I wanted to talk about is how we look at um, the difference uh, between history and memory and, and how um, we can get those two things to kind of coalesce. Here, to, as an example of that, here we have two pairs of shoes in the collection of the National Museum of American History. Um, these are two very different stories, um, but the emotions and memories and meanings for individuals and for our nation as a whole are really countless. Um, the one pair of shoes on the on the left, um, I think we'll all recognize um, Dorothy's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz. For millions of visitors to the Smithsonian every year, these shoes harken back to memories of the first time they cowered from, um, or fr from, uh, as or as my daughter does, delighted in what she calls the Green Witch um, uh, from The Wizard of Oz. Um, and these shoes never fail to arouse emotion and spark conversation. Um, but the other pair of shoes... And, you know, it's interesting, as you pull these up on the screen, I, I see an immediate comment here from Jocelyn in D.C. saying, The Wizard of Oz on the left, uh, but a question of uh, Anne Frank on the right, so definitely a, a curiosity about what those are, but not the same immediate recognition. Exactly. So, uh, and I see questions about uh, Dorothy and, and Rosa Parks. Uh, the other pair of shoes does come from the Civil Rights Movement, um, but... Um, Probably from someone um, few people remember, uh, they are the shoes belonging to Juanita Williams, who was the wife of Hosea Williams, who was an organizer of the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965 for voting rights that ultimately resulted in the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Uh, these... Um, these uh, shoes were worn on that long march from Selma to Montgomery uh, that uh, was the culmination of a movement that resulted in uh, many arrests, many deaths, uh, and, um, and you can see how those shoes were not only worn during that march, but worn down over the long uh, miles across the, um, the, the Alabama highways. 
uh, that that movement started with people doing the simple task of asking for the right to vote, of going to the courthouse and and registering or attempting to register uh, people who were met with um, who who showed an extreme amount of courage because just simply going and trying to register to vote in 1965 in uh, in Selma, Alabama, meant you're risking your very life. You're certainly risking your freedom. Uh, you might be you might encounter as this man did, Sheriff Jim Clark. Um, who he and his henchmen um, in Selma uh, were enforced segregation and the and um, unfair voting rights or, vo or the lack of voting rights with extreme force. Um, the uh, in the 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 first march that was attempted, um, we see the violence here that people uh, had people were faced with and, and withstood ultimately um, just for standing in the street and, and saying, I would like to vote. And um, so we always talk about the civil rights movement, civil rights struggle as um, taking the courage of those individuals who went first, people like Rosa Parks, people like, um, we'll talk about the Greensboro Four, people like the Selma um, marchers and uh, voting rights activists who were met with this, this sort of violence but also taking um, the commitment then, uh, this is another um, gentleman, Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was killed uh, during the Selma, Selma um, marches and the Selma protests, uh, taking then the commitment of an entire group to do what Juanita Williams did, to march, to continue to protest, to organize, um, and then to strategize. The, that's sort of the third, uh, Part of that, the third uh, necessity for that movement to come up with not just um, the courage to do it and the willingness to to sacrifice, but the strategy to plan out um, a real plan of attack in in order to um, try to gain uh, the freedoms that were being sought. So those shoes, to me, speak volumes to not. Um, uh, not just the, the, the courage of a few people and the leadership of a few people in the movement, but the, the, um, the courage, commitment, and, and strategizing of countless people whose names we may not remember, but who, uh, whose work and sacrifice and courage um, and planning were a part of uh, the freedoms that were ultimately gained during this period. Uh, another, as I mentioned, another name we all remember from the civil rights movement is Rosa Parks. Um, here is Ms. Parks sitting. This act photograph actually comes from after the Montgomery Boys boycott was uh, completed. There was no photograph taken of her on the day that she uh, that she refused to give up her seat on the bus. And uh, this photo was staged the first day that the buses were desegregated following the boycott and the actual actually the um, the reporter uh, who was writing a story about that is is the man who's sitting behind Rosa Parks in this very famous photograph um, Rosa Parks was arrested December 1st 1955 and um, December 5th 1955 I'm sorry and was um, and was taken uh, taken to jail fingerprinted and then this movement started and we all remember that, obviously. We remember that Martin Luther King rose from obscurity after this uh, event and began leading the movement. But uh, in the same vein as what I talked about in Selma, there were other names and other responsibilities in this movement that were, uh, that, that were essential. Um, there is standing with Martin Luther King. And note, too, that Martin Luther King is just 26 years old here. He's not. Um, necessarily the king that we remember. He was a young man himself with a young family, um, just started a job as a, uh, as a pastor in Montgomery. But there's Fred Gray, an attorney, um, who I think in this photograph is 24 years old. So another young man who was leading the legal fight, um, which was another part, major part of this, um, of the Montgomery bro uh, boycott. And that's Joanne Robinson, who 
was a school teacher um, at a university uh, teacher um, in Montgomery, and she stayed up all night spreading the word about the boycott, mimeographing, which means basically copying, like with uh, we didn't have a Xerox machine then, but mimeographing uh, leaflets to put all over the town in order to uh, spread the word that they needed everyone, all African Americans and anybody else at the who would join the movement to stay off those buses until these rules were changed. And then the people who did that, who not only, you know, these, these movements were not just, a, a boycott for one day wouldn't have mattered. Uh, in fact, there had, been, there had been short boycotts in Montgomery before, but um, a boycott that was really going to be effective would have to be long. And so that meant walking to work through a hot Alabama summer, walking uh, to school through uh, a, a winter and then into another winter. Um, so this uh, boycott lasted for 381 days. And so you just think about what that would mean for you um, today um, if you're doing without something that you use every single day for more than a year. And that required a great deal of commitment to a cause because there'd be some days where you just would want to get on one of those one of those empty buses that were rolling past you. So all of these women in this photograph uh, played a very important role. And then finally, as far as our objects to discuss here today, um, we have the the Greensboro lunch counter from the F. W. Woolworth store in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Racial segregation was perfectly legal um, on February 1st in 1960 when uh, four African-American college students sat down at this counter, uh, which has been part of the Smithsonian National Collection since 1994. Uh, when they were politely asked for service at this white only lunch counter, uh, their request was refused. When they were asked to leave, they remained in their seats. Their sit-in drew national attention and it helped to ignite uh, a, a movement led by young people um, to challenge racial inequality throughout the South. Now this wasn't the first sit-in that had ha ever happened. This wasn't the first time that young people had reacted in this way. Young people were certainly involved in the cases that led up to and that became the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case in 1954. Um, young people were uh, protesting, you know, and fighting for uh, fighting for the end of slavery in the 19th century, but there was something that happened that was different about um, this movement uh, and what started on February 1st, 1960, in Greensboro, because it lit a fire under thousands and thousands of young people all across the all across the country, and particularly the South, and sit-ins uh, like this began at similar, um, similar places um, like Woolworths. But as we say every day when we do programs at the lunch counter at the museum, um, it, did, it started with these four gentlemen. We should all know their names. Franklin McCain, Ezell Blair, Joseph McNeil, and David Richmond. Um, it started with them on that first day. Uh, but if it had just been that one protest, uh, we, we we wouldn't have had the effects that we had. Um, they had to come back the next day and the next, and others, um, uh, sorry, let me just move back here. Um, and, and it also wouldn't have been effective had people not been trained um, to, um, to, and there had not been strategy uh, involved in this. So they uh, took, uh, set up training sessions as people decided to take part in this movement um, to prepare for the violence that they might encounter, prepare for um, arrest, prepare for all of the uh, tactics of the segregationists that were going to be fighting against these people. So um, they needed that strategy. They needed to get the word out in the same way as we as we saw in Montgomery and Selma. They needed that kind of organization to turn it from a moment to a movement. And before we move on, I'd love to just uh, ask you to go a little bit more in depth into the lunch counter programs. Do, do you mind describing those for us? The programs we do at the museum, mm -hmm. you mean? Yes. Um, so 
we, we do a program called uh, Join the Student Sit-Ins. Um, it's performed right in front of this lunch counter, which is now one of the landmark objects in the museum. You're seeing a photograph from a few years ago when it was in another exhibition at the museum. It's now in a, in a more central location. And uh, we perform um, a play, an interactive play, where we ask visitors to take part in a training session for a sit-in. Uh, we ask visitors to, Im to imagine it is a few weeks after February 1st um, in 1960. And uh, the sit-ins have now spread across the, across the South. We've, been, we've seen protests even in the North where the Woolworths and other uh, businesses don't segregate, but sort of solidarity protests that were happening up there. Um, and, um, but because in order to make that movement really strong, we needed more and more people to take part. And uh, so our program is that training session that we're, we're really happening 50 years ago um, as, as students took that role and took that step to start protesting against segregation. And we ask people to sit through this session that is really devised just like a session of the time of the time period where you're given the rules of behavior. You need to dress in your Sunday best. You need to, uh, women shouldn't wear high heels or, uh, or, um, or, <laughs> or earrings. <laughs> um, we also have uh, asked men not to wear uh, regular ties, but wear clip-on ties. All of those things because you those could be uh, those could cause you injury. Um, people were told not to bring anything with them that might be seen as a weapon. Is any reason for um, the pol the police to be able to arrest uh, arrest the protesters and to sit quietly, stare forward, no matter what happened? And and you know this is a really scary situation. Um, we've talked to many people who are actually a part of sit-ins, and one of the most frightening parts, I think was that moment when you first step across this line, this line that is inside you that says, I know I shouldn't step across here because I'm going to get killed, uh, because it's, um, it's just going to be unsafe for me. And those people did that anyway. And as soon as they did, um, everyone around them in these, in these restaurants or other businesses noticed it, and there would be a hush that would go over the crowd. Everyone would just look and say, you know, what do they think they're doing here? Um, and the people that, uh, Greensboro um, students said, you know, the people that they thought might be on their side, the women, the African-American workers in the kitchen, um, they thought, oh, is this going to make me lose my job? Um, or are these students, these, you know, your, your students are making the making our race look bad by breaking the law or violating these rules. So um, we invite visitors to take a journey with us into this world and pretend uh, with us that they're part of that. And then think about whether we whether each of us would have that kind of courage, that kind of commitment um, to be a part of this. Just to understand that when you're taking not just a seat at one at at, at, at lunch counter but a seat in one of the one of the stools we set up outside the lunch counter imagining that we're doing a uh, that we are doing a uh, training session there that you're taking the role of one of these thousands of people whose names are not in any of our history books um, but whose story was just as important as some of the names that were are in the history books in causing our country to change for the better. You know, as you mentioned this, I'm really struck by Sandra's comment in D.C. Uh, my students are always amazed at how students could have agreed to participate in a nonviolent event. Not that they do not understand their desire for change, but they are not at all sure that they could have been nonviolent for a just cause. And we hear that uh, from many of the um, the protesters. I mean, this was you know, it's not. It was a radical thing to think about that nonviolence could be powerful, could be active, could change the world. Um, and um, and a lot of the leaders of the movement were really moved by 
Gandhi, moved by King, moved by those who felt like uh, no power in the world really could defeat nonviolence. But that's not something that we that we ordinarily think of, and it's not our initial human reaction when you sit down and uh, someone is calling you names, someone is threatening you. <clears throat> a natural behavior might be to fight back. Uh, Ezel Blair, who changed his name to um, Jabril Kazan, one of the original Greensboro Four protesters, said his father uh, had always taught him to fight back, that nonviolence was not a uh, natural response for him at all. And um, and he uh, that was something that he had to had to learn and had to understand was a tool uh, because violence was not going to end this because the segregationists, uh, the police who were enforcing the segregation laws, always had more capacity for violence than the protesters did and would win in a in a physical fight. So they realized that this was a better way to get things done. Now other people felt like it was not only a better way to get things to things done. It was not simply a tool, but it was also a way we should all live, and a lot of it came from their religious backgrounds. And, you know, a very quick follow-up to that. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Skeen in Oklahoma City asks, was there one of the civil rights groups that drafted these rules for use? Uh, it, it seems like a very specific tool and a very specific set of guidelines. That's a good, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, there were rules and, um, and manners of both comportment and, and um, sort of uh, uh, tactics that were drafted um, by, by each group. So we, we looked at, um, at, at uh, uh, plans done by both um, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. There was not, there's not one single sort of rule book or tactical plan for sit-ins that you can find um, each um, group that was working on it um, you know they somewhat learned as they as they went um, so you don't find so much that was written down as as um, as as a single tactical plan but looking at some of the leaders um, uh, a man named Reverend, Reverend James Lawson um, who was working in Nashville was um, one of the first who was using some of the Gandhian principles and teaching those to students in Nashville. Uh, that was really essential because they were that was happening in 1959 before the Greensboro pro protest began. Uh, those students were well trained and ready to spring into action as soon as that Greensboro protest, which was not related at all, um, happened. Um, and but we looked at quite a few of of uh, Jim Lawson's um, Jim Lawson's kind of prescriptions for how to how to fight against um, uh, against injustice nonviolently. But this still had to be learned. I mean, Martin Luther King uh, had armed guards uh, at his house during the early days of the of the Montgomery bus boycott, and a man named Bayard Rustin who. Uh, Eventually, was the architect, one of the major architects of the March on Washington in 1963, came to visit King when he heard about the Montgomery bus boycott and told, sat him down and said, "If you're going to be the leader of a nonviolent, uh, nonviolent army, you have to be nonviolent yourself, and you have to accept um, that." Um, that uh, you can't have guns in your house and and so forth, but you have to you know looking at this from Martin Luther King's point of view, he was getting death threats daily. Uh, there were bombings in 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 uh, in Montgomery um, related to this, and uh, he had um, one a little girl at home um, who had just been born, his daughter, and was again a 26 year old. Uh, young father um, who wanted to protect, you know, he wanted, he hadn't really signed up for this. I mean, he wanted to lead this this movement, but he wasn't necessarily starting out as, I'm going to be this, um, this leader of this giant movement that's going to change the country. He was just a young man who wanted to make changes in his community, and he's receiving death threats, so he acted like many fathers would act. He tried to protect his family, but um, so, you know, Martin Luther King even was learning 
the rules of um, nonviolent, uh, uh, leading a nonviolent uh, movement as he went along. So uh, one other object that I wanted to share uh, with you is uh, is uh, another good example of commitment. And these are uh, this is a set of playing cards. You can see the ace and the king of hearts right there. Um, and these were made, um, as you can see in, on the postmark there, in 1961, made from an envelope um, from a letter that was sent to uh, Joanne, or Joan Mulholland, um, who was a uh, participant in the 1961 Freedom Rides and um, had uh, left uh, her school and decided to participate in this uh, in this movement, 1961, uh, to try to desegregate public transportation. It's interesting thing. One interesting thing about the Freedom Rides is that um, the Freedom Riders weren't in in boarding buses to head to the through the South um, from Washington D.C. Um, they weren't violating any law because this was interstate transit. The Supreme Court, the interstate interstate uh, Commerce Commission had already said that segregation on uh, interstate public transportation was unconstitutional, but the southern states weren't listening to that and were arresting people and enforcing um, unconstitutional illegal laws um, uh, regardless. So Freedom Riders decided to sit, to get onto buses and really force the government to enforce its own laws, force the federal government to step in and, um, and uh, do uh, what the states uh, were, were re re resisting to do. Um, and uh, the Freedom Riders, um, ultimately, many of them were imprisoned um, in Parchman uh, uh, State Prison in, in Mississippi. Um, and um, and were uh, and headed off to uh, to jail and um, and so uh, Joan Mulholland, in order to pass the time, and this is again speaking to commitment, uh, in order to pass the time, would play cards uh, with what she uh, had to play cards with, which was homemade cards out of this uh, this envelope that she cut and made into cards, and this is part of the collection of the Smithsonian. Um, a couple, couple other things that I'll quickly get through. So, uh, going back to the beginning with Lincoln um, and his work, this is the ink stand that Lincoln was using to draft the Emancipation Proclamation. He would uh, sit often at the War Department telegraph office and was listening or waiting for reports to come in from the field. And while he was there, uh, the telegraph operator said he would. Uh, always be working on this document that he told the telegraph officer was going to uh, free the slaves in the South. So this is a moment that we all remember, we know about the Emancipation Proclamation, but um, what we may not always think about is all of the forces that were push that were forcing Lincoln's hand as his pen was moving across that, uh, that paper. Um, and uh, one of those forces was the the choices made by the enslaved African Americans themselves on plantations um, in the Upper South. Um, those who uh, were able to were close enough to the Union lines to uh, pack up a wagon like this and uh, teams of oxen and throw everything that they owned or possessed or needed into that wagon and head north. Um, Washington, during the Civil War, became a refugee city. And um, as the historian Barbara Fields has said, that um, every slave who made an issue of himself to the local commanders in the army, to, um, to people in Washington by just frankly packing up and, and living in a tent in, in Washington, um, in one of the tent cities or the contraband cities that were that were uh, that were uh, set up here, every person who made that issue of him or herself 
made a figure of himself ultimately to the uh, to the the nation and to the president of the United States, who had to walk past these refugees every day um, and think about uh, well, what are we going to do with all of these people? This is here's an obvious um, issue that we have to take. Even if we win the war, we need to um, we we need to do something with these people, and you know ultimately decide can I can I expect to send these people back to um, um, to slavery after they've made these hard choices and traveled this rough road to get here. Um, and that uh, was one issue that was certainly forcing Lincoln's hand and on Lincoln's mind uh, as he worked on that document. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really amazing images to be going through. And uh, great to read the comments that we have popping into the chat, too, as well as a lot of great resources there. So I hope that if anyone has missed them as they've scrolled by, you'll take a second to, to take a look at them. Um, before we jump into our next segment here, I'd love to launch some of these video questions that we have from our students, and uh, maybe both of you can, can say something to them. Uh, I'm going to pull up the first one right here. Great, and so this is our first student question. My name is Milo from Washington, D.C., and I'm a second grader. What were schools like for kids in the 50s and 60s and now? Great, and I think, uh, and now in, in comparison to now. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you so much, Milo, for submitting your question. Yeah, Milo, that's a great question. You know, we um, had an exhibition at the Smithsonian uh, a few years ago on the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. And that was the case where uh, the Supreme Court decided that separate educational facilities, edu separate educational facilities in the country were inherently unequal and therefore couldn't be allowed, were unconstitutional. In that exhibition, we set up um, a classroom, a typical classroom from uh, the pre um, Brown versus Board of Education days in the South and an African American community. Um, you could imagine uh, that um, the whereas the uh, school for uh, white children would be have new textbooks and new um, equipment and desks, the um, the school for African Americans would be um, just be run down, um, be, have drafty uh, walls, you know, holes in the walls. So it's cold and uncomfortable just to be in. The textbooks um, would maybe be non-existent. Um, so it depended definitely on the on the region and where you're talking about. Um, but there, um, but. What we wanted to do is give people a tangible opportunity to sit down at one of these um, in a segregated school um, that just didn't have have the resources that the other schools did, and it, and also we were not just talking about um, a black and white issue because um, in many areas where uh, Latino children went to school and in a on a segregated basis so the same um, things applied that the schools just wouldn't have the um, the resources wouldn't have the um, you know even the physical structure of the school would just not be as good as the school for um, for the um, the majority race and so um, again it was a it was it, it depended on where you were but generally it just was not um, during segregation, um, the uh, the situation uh, was not only what the Supreme Court said eventually was that that just the fact that you have to separate people, even if the schools were exactly the same, and you know even if the te the teachers teaching at each school were twins, you know, and they're perfect exam perfect uh, uh, recreations of of the school on one side or or, or the other. Um, Though just because you had to separate people, you're telling people that well, if we're separating you, one has to be one. We're separating people because one person is better than the other, and so that's inherently equal, unequal. But um, 
it was also the case that even it, it, though they were um, that they were never exactly equal. Um, always one was worse than the other, and usually it was the the um, African American school um, in the South that was much worse than the than the school for whites. And I think just to jump in, this is uh, Naomi. I, I think. Um, this is a topic that we, you know, we'd encourage students to um, research and find out on their own. I mean, this is lived history, and so there are people who can talk about that experience. Um, students can interview people uh, who went to school in the 50s and 60s and, um, and find out about it um, that way. So they're sort of learning the history and doing the history themselves. That's a great point. Thank you. I think I'll take a moment now to just field our next video question here. And I'm going to play that on the screen now. Hi, my name is Hannah, and I'm a seventh grader in Virginia. And my question is, how does the African American Civil Rights Movement connect to all of the human rights movements in American history? Great, so definitely a big question there, but maybe you can give us some starting points to explore those connections. Well, and uh, I would say that... Um, the things that I talked about in terms of courage, uh, commitment, and strategy, those were, those were tactics and those were ways of thinking about um, a movement that the people uh, leading the civil rights movement and the fight to end slavery uh, took from other movements um, of the time period, uh, you know, th uh, throughout our history. Um, you can look back at uh, many things that took place during the civil rights movement and find people using the same tactics um, in uh, the women's suffrage movement, in the temperance movement in the 19th century. In fact, the temperance movement and the and, and women's suffrage um, uh, movement, many of the leaders of those movements also worked for abolition of slavery in the 19th century. So uh, they are very, um, they're using very similar tactics, um, and uh, and each movement was learning from its predecessors. And I'm also going to echo what Naomi said that, um, and kind of turn that question back around, and and invite uh, you to one research it and think about it yourself. But you know, our as we're doing our discussion, um, a lot, uh, our chat here, you know, if any out of one else wants to jump in with some some examples of ways that uh, human rights movements and civil rights movements have been similar, um, please share that with us. Great. And I actually see an early example here from Susan in D.C. pointing out that uh, the labor movement influenced rent strikes, et cetera, uh, and that, yes, each one does glean from the others. Great. So, and actually, um, it's a nice segue in the sense that we um, sort of asked this question ourselves of a recent program. Uh, and I'll, so I'm, I want to talk a little bit about our um, educational resources and talk a little bit about how we can um, teach about some of the people and the ideas, the events that Chris uh, discussed. Um, and I'm going to do that by talking about resources on our website. Uh, and the easiest way to find those is um, through Smithsonian's History Explorer. Uh, this is our online portal for all of our educational materials. Um, and for anyone who's interested in looking, and I, I know a bunch of you guys, about half of you have already used our materials in the past. Um, but if you haven't, uh, this is a searchable site. You can search by keyword, um, but also filter to get the resources that you need. Uh, this is a quick example. We did a civil rights search and uh, filtered just by grade level on the right-hand side and resource type, which is interactives and media. Um, so you can see we have a bunch of different resources that are videos, podcasts, um, interactives on civil rights. Um, or if you're looking for artifacts uh, like the Greensboro lunch counter or, for example, this um, broken school bus window to do some analysis with students. I saw some discussion in the chat about how to do that with the shoes. Um, you can find that on our uh, website as well. Um, and lastly, the best of our resources are um, tagged on our themes page. So there's a themes page for the civil rights movement, but also for Link uh, Lincoln. Um, so you can find uh, materials there, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, pieces you'd find. Um, so to Hannah's question, uh, on Monday we hosted a National Youth Summit, um, which we host about one a year, uh, and that is a webcast for students where we think about a historical issue um, and then uh, discuss its contemporary connections. So for this one, um, being that it's the 150th anniversary of the um, Emancipation Proclamation, we wanted to think about 
um, the nature of slavery and how you end slavery. What, how do we answer that question? And so what we did was looked to the 19th century abolition movement um, and looked at the, some of the tactics that abolitionists used then um, to think about how we could end modern day slavery. And so we had a conversation with an historian. Um, you can see here, uh, this is Lois Brown. Um, Ken Morris, who's the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, uh, as well as um, Ambassador Luis C. de Baca, who is the um, head of the Office to Monitor and uh, Combat Trafficking in Persons at the State Department, um, and a student uh, who is working on um, abolishing modern slavery. So we thought about what are the what are the lessons we can learn from that movement um, about using communications tools, um, how uh, narratives are important, um, different kinds of uh, ways that we can um, spread the message um, and sort of apply that to today. And so for teachers, um, if you're interested in thinking about that conversation, this this webcast is archived as are all of our webcasts on History Explorer or will be shortly. Um, oh, go ahead. John. Before we continue on, could mm -hmm. you take a quick moment to define abolitionist for, for everyone who's with us? Sure. Um, well, abolitionist is someone who, uh, you know, worked to um, to end slavery in the 19th century, they were fairly radical. Um, people like John Brown are, are good examples, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, you know, actually, a student we, we went to talk with some students who were coming to the program, and they they wanted to know how broad the term is. And I think, you know, it it, it um, relates to a specific sort of moment in um, in history. We we think of of this particular um, set of people who were like William Lloyd Garrison um, actively advocating, you know, the end of slavery. Um, but, you know, people argue, well, was Lincoln an abolitionist? Well, he probably uh, didn't see himself as part of that movement, but he, you know, did work to abolish slavery. So I think it's, you know, it's, um, Chris, you can jump in if there's more you, you know, want to suggest. But, um, you know, people d just debate and discuss, I guess, that, that definition. Um, yeah, I, I think I, um, one thing I'd, I just add is mm -hmm. is with um, in in abolition. Um, I was thinking of uh, historian David Reynolds, who mm -hmm. recently wrote both mm -hmm. books on John Brown and um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And so there you have two diff very different ways of um, being an abolitionist. So you have John Brown, who determined that uh, nonviolence, what uh, we would call Today, nonviolence, what people referred to in the 19th century as moral suasion, mm -hmm. uh, trying to persuade someone with morality um, and with just the, the right thing to do, he decided that that was just never going to work because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, didn't seem to be working um, because the, the, those who supported slavery were getting more and more violent. They were passing more and more laws um, that prevented any real fight against um, slavery. And so he felt like the only thing um, to do and the best thing to do was to fight, declare war on slavery, was to fight violently against slavery, was really ultimately to try to overthrow at least part of the country and attack a, a federal um, uh, arsenal, take weapons, arm the slaves, and lead a rebellion. Um, uh, Reynolds also you know, wrote a book about Harriet Beecher Stowe, who looked at, uh, saw the same issues. I mean, so both of them had uh, really awful situations where they saw slaves being abused. Stowe decides to write um, the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which um, changes all kinds of people's minds about slavery. And Lincoln says that, oh, you're the, when he meets her, you're the late little lady who started this great big war. So they both did fought against slavery, but in very different ways. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I know people are asking about more information, as Ashley mentioned. The, the, we, we just had this program on Monday, so it's, uh, the archived webcast isn't available yet, but it will be. And it, you can find it through History Explorer once we have it archived. Um, we also have uh, a conversation kit, which has a lot of resources on abolitionism uh, and modern slavery, um, which is available online now. So um, you can uh, find them um, at the website that, that Ashley mentioned. Um, so. I'll move next to the Greensboro lunch counter. Um, Chris has uh, mentioned that we have, and I think Ashley put up the website for the Stories of Freedom and Justice page, which has um, a video of the Join the Student Sit-Ins program. It also has um, the first of our sort of youth summit style of programs. Um, 
which was a, a conversation with the surviving members of the Greensboro Four. Um, so you can find that on History Explorer as well if you'd like your students to hear um, hear them talking with students. They, we had an audience of young people here, um, and they talked about their experience. Um, as well um, as we've had uh, members of the Freedom Rides come. Uh, that was in 2011. And just to give you a sense of what these programs look like, uh, if you wanted to use one in your class, or if you wanted to sign up for a future program, because we will have uh, one on Freedom Summer next next year, um, to do if you want to do the program live, uh, you can get a sense of this. This is um, uh, a conversation. You can see on the stage we have uh, Diane Nash, James Lawson, Jim Zwerg, and uh, John Lewis. Um, and in this clip, uh, you'll hear a student ask a question about basically what can students do today, and Diane Nash has a really powerful response. And these are the kinds of questions and conversations that we really try to foster in these youth summits. Um, I just a word of warning: um, the student question is fairly loud, and then it gets softer. So just prepare yourselves for uh, a little bit of um, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. My name is Brooke Griffin from Holmes High School in Cove. Kentucky and our question is it is clear to me from the film that you have had a strong sense of the power of democracy even though it had not worked for you in the society why did you take the individual responsibility to help lead the freedom rights and how do you suggest individuals to take responsibility to improve democracy today Diane Would you repeat that? Uh, the question has to do with the responsibility of the individual to do something to improve or perfect democracy today, the kind of the legacy of the Freedom Rides, what does that help us to understand the role of the individual in a democracy? Um, I was at the beginning of my adult life at that time. And I was very conscious of the fact that I would be bringing children into the world and I wanted my children and other children to be born into and come of age in the best uh, world, the best society I could help bring about. I think one of the real problems uh, today is that I hear people who seem to feel that if they vote, they are being a responsible citizen. And that is so wrong. That 10 minutes that people spend in the voting booth every two years is not enough. I think back sometimes um, and, and wonder if we in the civil rights movement had left it to elected officials to desegregate restaurants and lunch counters and to desegregate buses. I wonder how long we would have had to wait. And I think truly that we might still be waiting. <laughs> Great. So I know we're running out of time, but I felt it was really important um, to share that clip because I think um, I just think it's a really powerful message um, and one that students should hear. And I think we all felt that um, there was a question about who produces the Youth Summit, and that's uh, Chris and um, some of our and, and and me and a few of our colleagues. Um, and so I'll tell you how to keep in touch with us uh, at the end. I'll try to rush through. Um, uh, you can, if you have questions about the about the Youth Summit. So I'm going to go really, really quickly here, and I apologize. Um, again, all of this is on History Explorer. You can search for materials there. Um, we have, uh, Chris created a, a program to think about John Brown, but also about this issue of history and memory. It's called The Time Trial of John Brown. Um, and in this program, uh, basically, John Brown's legacy is put on trial. So the audience is asked to think about, I should actually just have you describe it, but in any case, uh, John Brown, uh, we, we think about what, how we should remember John Brown. Is his legacy a positive one? Is it a negative one? Is it somewhere in between? Um, and in the live program, as you can see, we, we actually talk with John Brown directly, but um, what we have online are clips of our actor portraying John Brown responding to some of the essential questions that people usually ask about him. So, you know, why didn't you use nonviolence? Or what happened at Kansas? Or are you a terrorist? Or things like that. And so you can um, invite the students to think about um, John Brown's 
choice uh, and decisions um, and how we should re remember him. And you can play his pieces um, to think about, uh, to help sort of spur a conversation and to think more deeply. Um, so also, we, we have the Join the Student Sit-Ins program online. Ashley shared the, the link for the Freedom and Justice page, and Chris described it already. Um, I'll just say that uh, you know, if you can come to the museum and do it live, that's wonderful. If you can't, we have the video on our website. And what we've done with um, teacher groups uh, is have them do what is the centerpiece of the, um, of the program, which is a sort of mock sit-in. And so you know, a few volunteers pretend to be protesters and the rest of the people stand around and just in a sort of stand silently. Um, but just that physical presence is a really powerful experience. We usually do it along with the video because um, our, our actor is, is very powerful and I think um, sort of helps to set the stage. But there's also the script is available online if you wanted to just simulate it yourself. But that um, embodying the moment, I mean, we're never really, we're never going to know what that feeling was like. But, um, but sort of being present in that way, I think, draws people into the story in a, in a way that's different. It's much more personal um, and can lead to some really fascinating conversations. So again, that's available for you online. Um, also, if you want your students to hear directly from Chris about um, freedom songs and their role in the movement, uh, we have a podcast series for middle school students, um, and uh, one of which is about freedom songs, including the, the one that you heard at the start of the program, which is actually the beginning of the Join the Student Students program. We use that as well. Um, it's about 20 minutes long, uh, and it's a really wonderful introduction to, um, uh, to the role of, of song and music in the movement. Um, and then lastly, uh, our Our Story resource set. This is really for K4, but uh, we've actually had some of these materials published in middle level learning uh, through NCSS, so there may be something here for middle school teachers and students. Um, this is a, a way that we introduce young people to history through historical fiction. Um, there are activities designed for parents and caregivers to do with, with children. Uh, and we've got a range of, of resources. Um, and each of the activity sets has a central book. So for example, we look at Follow the Drinking Gourd to think about slavery um, and the Underground Railroad, so how, did, how people um, found, uh, you know, brought themselves to freedom. Um, or, uh, and there's a, a reading guide that goes along with it. The next one you see is uh, Seven Miles to Freedom about um, an African-American boy who was enslaved, escaped, and became a US congressman, a man named Robert Smalls. Um, so there's a reading guide that goes with the book, and then an activity set. So there's uh, Take a Trip, you can see. Um, we encourage people to think about um, field trips they can take in their own neighborhoods to learn history through, uh, through the local, a local lens. Um, a Play and Create, which is to do a craft activity. Um, use technology, which uh, invites students to uh, obviously use computers, the internet, um, to uh, better understand the topic. Um, there's also a study in schools so that's um, more designed for classroom use. Um, and next, uh, and then we have a few on civil rights, including a, a resource set uh, about the book Freedom on the Menu, which is also about the sit-ins. Um, and uh, Martin's Big Words, which is a really wonderful book that uses um, uh, pieces of Martin Luther King's speeches to tell his life story. Um, so again, you can find all of these on, on History Explorer. There are lots of materials to help support um, your conversations about these in your classes. Um, I'll also mention, uh, Chris talked about shoes, and I think that seemed to be um, of real interest. Uh, so we actually have a teaching poster that's uh, about shoes. Unfortunately, the um, Juanita Williams shoes are not on here. Uh, but there are others here with really intriguing stories. If you'd like a copy of this uh, for your classroom, you can email us at historyteachers at si.edu. Um, and uh, there are um, the ruby slippers. Uh, the, there are iron shoes from a chemist. Um, they are, uh, there are Abigail Adams shoes. Those are the yellow ones. Um, so I see a question there. If it was a first lady shoes, they are. Um, as well as uh, boots from the Korean War. And these are, they can be writing prompts, they can be conversations about identity, they can just be a good way to introduce um, the past through a really personal lens. Um, and I'll say too that uh, in April, on April 10th, um, there will be um, a conference like this with some of our colleagues from the museum, Steve Velasquez and Nancy Davis, uh, who will be looking at immigration and migration stories, and they'll be using shoes, among other resources, to sort of tell the, that story from a personal perspective. So if you're interested in, in that sort of teaching method, do, do be sure to join for that um, program. Great, and I believe that's the From Where I Stand conference. Yes, that's right. Yeah, From Where I Stand, sorry. 
Um, so uh, just to, in sum, if you want to find more materials from us or ask us questions, you can email us at the, at the address before. Find us on Twitter at Explore History. Um, or you can sign up for our email newsletter. It's a monthly um, announcement about what we're doing at the museum. Uh, so we hope to, uh, we hope you found some materials that are useful um, and that you'll be in touch with us. Uh, and I think at this point I'll turn it back to Adam um, Wonderful. for a wrap-up. Yeah, thank you so much, Naomi and Chris. That was excellent. It was so great to have a look at some of the material and then some of the resources available to really uh, launch much deeper in a lot of these areas. I, I wish we had uh, two more hours to just keep going through this because I'm fascinated and I can tell from the chat that we, we've even had some people say, I'll stay longer. So thank you, Susan in DC. <laughs> nice to know you feel the same way. Uh, but I would like to point out that if you have asked questions that you haven't had an an answer to today, because we didn't quite have enough time for all of them, uh, we do hope that you'll go to the discussion forum and post your unanswered questions there. And we'll really try to continue that conversation and, and get you some answers and, and continue to address points on the conference website. So please do follow up with us in that space. Uh, I'd like to just say a big thank you to uh, everyone who worked on this conference. Uh, Naomi and Chris, fantastic work, and uh, our closed captioners at WGBH. Uh, it was wonderful uh, having you with us through, and thank you for staying a little overtime with us. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you, Ashley, for reviewing the badging with us at the start of the session. I'd like to just take a quick moment to point out our next session taking place, Civil Rights Historical Legacies and Today's Achievements. The next conference will be A Will of Their Own, Judith Murray and Women of Achievement in the Early Republic. And that's taking place on Wednesday, March 13th at 4 p.m., so we hope that you'll jump onto the conference website, register, and make a note in your calendar. But even now, as we are just wrapping up, I want to leave you with one more Smithsonian Folkways recording, and you'll see the information for that at
Amen.